You don't get an ability and I'm not going to be by Jerang. I'm going to be Nanya Bayami. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. How are you all this morning? That's awesome. My name is Shannon Ruska, and I've been asked to give you what is uh, labelled as a welcome to country. A welcome to country is, is uh, something that the Aboriginal people have been doing since the beginning of time. My father's an Aboriginal man, my mother's a non Indigenous woman. My father descends from. Uh, three different clans around southeast Queensland. One is from uh, the Yagara people of Brisbane City and uh, the Caboolture River south to the Logan River and out to the Great Dividing Ranges, the country. And uh, Turrbal is one of the clans that he descends from. And the other uh, tribal groups is from the Gold Coast, the Combomeri people and the Nunaco people of North Stradbroke Island as well. Uh, a welcome to country is, is uh, a, a common thing that the Aboriginal people do when they travel from country to country, just as we would go into the different countries throughout the world, we'd like to be welcomed by the traditional people of that country. In Australia, there's over 350 different Aboriginal languages that are recorded on paper and many, many different dialects. We speak four different dialects in this region alone. Uh, in one language, within one language. Uh, different methods of travelling from country to country for the Aboriginal people. One, which we t touch on in a, in a larger ceremony that's just started recently uh, in an initiative between the government and the Aboriginal people, is clancestry. And in the opening, we touched on uh, one method of where we light smoke signals from the different mountains around. We use mountains as our markers and, and places uh, to be able to put smoke signals up, then we get the return and it's okay to come over. Uh, other ways is, is through message stick which had carvings or paintings on and that would give reason why you were going into to a particular country. Uh, similar to a modern day passport and visa when we travel from country to country today, uh, that's how, how we do it. Um, other ways is, uh, if you're travelling alone, it's a call out. So what I'm going to ask you to do is, can you all do this? Can you all go, yo, on the count of three. One, two, three. Yo. Now we haven't finished. The last part is the high pitch, just in case that bloke over the river didn't hear. And it's, yay, on the count of three. Here we go, guys. We'll crack them voices early in the morning. Ready, set, go. All right, so we're going to put all that together. We're pretending we're walking over, got to the one side of the river, we see the bark canoe and we're ready to go across. We've got to let that mob know we're coming. Yo! Yay! On the count of three. Everyone together. One, two, three. Yo! All right, now you know the call out. You're talking a bit of our language. Ladies and gentlemen, yura yura, hello all. You're not going to read by sit down on our land. Uh, may God and our ancestors guide you in peace as you gather on the traditional lands of the Yagara durable people. Thank you and welcome. G'day everyone, my name's Wayne Gerard. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a local Queensland startup called Red Eye. Welcome to day two of the Innovation and Investment Summit in Queensland. So glad you could join us. Give it up for Shannon. It's such an important part of our heritage to do a formal welcome to country and I really appreciate Shannon taking the time to do that. Thank you so much. Um, you're in the startup state. So you're in the startup state, hashtag startup state. The Premier said it on uh, Wednesday night and I would love it to stick because what a great way to think about the opportunities that our state has. So Queensland is the startup state and I would love to introduce the startup minister, the Minister for Innovation, the lovely Leanne Enoch. Bring her up. Go, go, go. I thought I was getting a high five on the way out. It was like feeling pretty full energy there. It's great. Uh, well, good to see everybody. Um, let me begin, of course, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we gather. 
And in doing so, may I acknowledge the more than 3,000 generations of Yuggera people and Turrbal people who have maintained cultural practices on this country. And can I acknowledge all of our elders from wherever you come from, whatever your culture, those that have passed and those still with us guiding us into the future. Well, how exciting to be here on the second day of the Advanced Queensland Innovation and Investment Summit, which uh, this part of the summit is really the Startup Festival. Uh, this is the first time that we've ever had a startup festival of this nature in our state. And it goes to show that that is where our greatest focus is as we're moving forward. And yes, I think, you know, Wayne, the more we keep saying it, the startup state, uh, the more we hope that it will stick. Uh, I think uh, it might have been yesterday that uh, Wayne and the Premier were talking about, you know, uh, license plates and all kinds of things. And I think Wayne was going to arm wrestle the Premier for the first license plate, but I uh, have to warn him, she's pretty tough. I don't think he has much of a chance. So, <laughs> but look, uh, I guess today I just wanted to um, uh, welcome you all here today for this inaugural Startup Festival, part of our summit, and uh, start with a bit of a, I guess, conversation about what startup means for our state. Now, when, since I've had this job, one of the things that has been really remarkable, uh, it's, the, it's a question that I get asked that has really stood, uh, stuck in my brain, I guess. It's a question that I'm asked by everybody in the startup sector. It's the first question. And it's always, how can I help? How can I help? That is the first question I get asked by every startup I ever meet in our state. And that is a great place to start from. When you think about the energy, the creativity, uh, the direction that we want to be going, if we start with how can I help, then we get an opportunity to be really positive about, the, uh, about where we're heading into the future. And to have all of you here today, and I know this, it's very clear that this is startup because uh, you know, people will take their time to get here in the morning, uh, and it was a big night last night. Uh, but that how can you help um, positivity, that frame is really going to set us uh, in a, the right frame of mind for the kinds of things that we're going to be seeing today. There are, are an array of speakers that will be that you'll be, uh, have the opportunity to listen to. Uh, incredible speakers. We've been so fortunate that we've got some really class acts that have said, yes, we want to be part of the conversation in Queensland about startup. And uh, so I'm looking forward to all of those speakers today. But of course, this particular part of the summit is a key platform to showcase uh, local innovators, strengthen national and international connections, and ignite innovation and collaboration. And like I said, I can't wait to see what amazing new ideas come from the new connections made at today's festival. And if we come from that frame of how can I help, then I know that we're going to generate some incredible ideas going forward. Uh, but I wanted to acknowledge those speakers. Uh, they are giving their time um, uh, for free. Uh, they are here because they are coming from that same frame of how can I help. So they're giving their time free, and I, I just wanted to say thank you for their generosity. Um, the way that they'll be able to inspire all of us to help us on our journey to success, and of course, help us contribute to the eco um, economic future of our state. But building momentum in our innovation movement and fostering entrepreneurship right across our state is a key priority of um, the Queensland Government's Advanced Queensland Initiative. You've all heard much about this over the last 12 months. It is our $180 million initiative. It's all about um, supporting the broader ecosystem and ensuring that we are ready for the economies of the future. And we understand as a government that startups and that entrepreneurial nature, that culture, is, is really where we're going to see job generation in the future. So it's an incredibly important part of Advanced Queensland, an important part of where we're going to see Queensland's economic future. Um, but I guess the other thing I wanted to say is that's not just about South East Queensland. That's about all of Queensland, no matter where you are. And I wanted just to give a big shout out to the 50-odd uh, uh, regional startups that we've been able to support to come here uh, for this festival. Uh, so glad that you're all here from Townsville, Rockhampton, Mackay, uh, Toowoomba. <laughs> Mackay just got excited because they were mentioned. <laughs> Cairns. Uh, so we're seeing people right across the state engaged in these conversations. Incredibly important. So thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Um, but the other thing, I guess, is if you, in case you missed it yesterday, 
The Premier announced the Advanced Queensland Startup Precinct in the TC Burn uh, building just down the road in Fortitude Valley um, to really, I guess, foster that uh, startup culture in our state. Uh, the precinct idea, I guess, started about three years ago. It was a vision of the Startup Working Group, the Queensland Government Startup Working Group. And I can tell you they are a passionate uh, group of people who are strong advocates uh, for where they see the innovation ecosystem heading in this state into the future. Uh, this precinct uh, down in the valley will have more than 5,000 square metres of floor space. Uh, it'll include co-working spaces, startup incubators and accelerator programs, as well as hosting industry-led events and meetups, uh, and the opportunity to be able to collaborate across startups that are happening right across our state. Um, even though that, is, that particular precinct is based in um, Fortitude Valley, its relationship to the rest of the ecosystem across our state will be absolutely crucial. So I look forward to those connections into the future. Uh, but uh, for me, uh, I guess we're wait the Premier will be speaking to us soon and formally um, uh, welcoming you all to the Startup Festival. But from me personally, thank you for your investment. Uh, thank you for being part of the innovation movement in Queensland. Uh, we know that this movement, this innovation movement, our Advanced Queensland Initiative, is going to change the face of Queensland. It will change the face of uh, our economy. It will position us as a global leader, as a, as a national leader, and you are all part of it. This is the very beginning of some new work that's going to be happening in our state. So thank you so much for your attendance today. Those people who are live streaming also from across the regions, uh, remain, remain engaged. There are some incredible speakers on their way to this stage uh, throughout today. Thank you again, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Uh, keep the energy high. And let's start, of course, from that frame of um, how can I help? Thank you. There you go. Well done. Now? Wow. This is such a flexible uh, environment at a startup festival, right? Because, you know, startups adapt on the go to change. And so what is happening right now is a little bit of awesome change. And with that, I'd like to introduce the Premier, the wonderful uh, Anastasia Palaszczuk, the, the uh, Premier for the Startup State. Come on up. <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone, and it's uh, lovely to see you here. And as uh, Wayne said, uh, welcome to the Startup State. I like that name. What does everyone else think? <laughs> Can I start by uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we gather and pay my respects to Elders past and present. And of course I want to acknowledge uh, my wonderful Minister Leanne Enoch. She has just been doing a tremendous job in uh, leading in relation to innovation and science and technology and she has such a comprehensive grasp of uh, what is needed in this state that I know she's working really well with each and every one of you and uh, so many good things are going to come from this state through your support. So can we give Leanne a big round of applause? <laughs> now, I want to do a big thank you as well to Wayne. Uh, this was actually Wayne's idea. So Wayne's a member of my uh, business, uh, Premier's Business Advisory Panel. So with, without him, we would not be here today. So let's give Wayne a big round of applause. And to all the summit delegates that are here, to uh, people who are uh, live streaming in, uh, it's, uh, can I welcome you to Queensland if you're from uh, streaming in from overseas, there's no better place than Queensland. Uh, I think everyone here would agree with that. And uh, look, I also want to give a big thank you uh, to everyone who's been involved uh, with putting the program together over the last two days, and of course our organiser, Teresa. So let's give everyone a big round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> Well, during the course of today, we'll have over 527 people here, and there was uh, another half as many that were also on the waiting list. So it just goes to show that there is a lot of interest in this area. And over the two days, more than 1,200 key investors, entrepreneurs, and leaders in industry and government have come from around Australia and overseas. 
and this summit has provided a global perspective on opportunities of innovation here in Queensland. I know Leanne's spoken to you a bit about our $180 million advanced Queensland package. Well, that's not the end of it. We've got a budget coming up next month and Advanced Queensland is going to be front and centre of my government's budget. And you've got a, a government and a full cabinet that is 100% behind each and every one of you in this room. So we're determined to work with you to take us to the next level. We're determined to demonstrate and develop the capacity here in Queensland to commercialise good ideas. Today's sessions are designed to do just that. They bring together startups, investors and businesses to engage with successful investors. The ever-increasing reach of potential customers in today's world is staggering in both its spread and the speed at which it's growing. By next year, there will be an estimated 2.7 billion smartphones in use around the world, one for every three people on the planet. And in Australia, our use here is estimated to be a staggering 90%. I want to share with you a story about Queenslander Will Wilson, and he's shown just what one smartphone can do. Will's a cattle producer at Calliope in central Queensland, and the day he got his first smartphone, he realised he had the world in his hands. Will told himself that it wasn't a toy, it was a tool. Will soon developed an app that disrupted the labour-intensive and error-prone paper system farmers used to keep track of their stock. Four years later, 40,000 users of the iHerd app are tracking 30 million animals in 120 countries, and Will's company, Mandra, is developing world-leaded integrated information management systems. I caught up with Will yesterday and he, he told me that this summit was being streamed back to his business partners in Hong Kong. And he also told me that he's had a lot more calls uh, from other international players uh, just because of this summit. So some good things are already happening. So congratulations, Will. But his story emphasises the innovative people with great ideas across the length and breadth of Queensland. And it covers such diverse uh, ranges of portfolios, like Wills was in, you know, agriculture, and, you know, but there's so many other options. It's not just medical devices, it's in everything we do. And it's all about your ideas and it's about not being afraid of failure. There's one thing that I learnt when I went over to Silicon Valley just last year, is that you've got to keep trying, you've got to keep getting up, you've got to just keep going with your ideas and believe in yourself. So if we all have that attitude, and I know Queenslanders do have that attitude, we will definitely be the start-up state. So I know regional Queensland can also play a big role. A recent government report identified more than 80 start-ups in regional Queensland, employing 450 people with clusters emerging in not just agriculture, tourism and professional services. Australia and Asia are closer than ever before with the new free trade agreement with Japan, South Korea and China and ongoing talks with India and Indonesia. Increasingly, consumption-driven markets across Asia will account for two-thirds of the world's middle class by 2030 and they are a short flight away in similar time zones. In fact, that growing middle class in China is going to reach 800 million people. So just think about that for a market for a moment, 800 million people. Uh, and that middle class, it's all going to be driven by consumption. So it's a, it's a change from the uh, commodities, it's about consumption, and that middle class is going to want to travel. And if you think about it at the moment, only between 6 and 9% of people living in China have passports. So wait till they get passports. They want to go and explore the world. And we need to be partnering with them in every endeavour. We know innovations can originate in the Burdekin Valley, in Fortitude Valley, or indeed Dawson Valley near Will, just as they do in Silicon Valley. And the opportunity and the challenges is there to commercialise these innovations. Well, today I'd like to talk to you about a significant announcement. Uh, today might be the business end of this festival, but it's really just the beginning. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to announce that Queensland, through my government, has reached an agreement with international event company Myriad with a three-year deal to stage an annual innovation and start-up festival here in Brisbane.
Now, what's good about that? Well, they're not going to Melbourne. They're not going to Sydney. They're not going to Adelaide. Queensland is the winner. They spoke to us. They wanted to do it in Queensland, and we've said yes. So here we are embracing this uh, amazing international festival. It will bring people from all around the world. And as I said, today is just the beginning. It's the beginning of attracting uh, people from all around the world to come to Brisbane each year to view the opportunities that they can aspire to. The founding members of Myriad have been involved in the design and delivery of world-renowned events such as SXSW and Slush, and they will call Brisbane home from 2017 to 2019. And following the success of this summit and the Startup Festival, it's critical that we maintain the momentum. This agreement will allow us to harness the experience of the team in shaping technology events to deliver the best of global startup culture in a uniquely Australian way right here in Queensland. They will host an annual program of events and activities that generate global connections for Queensland entrepreneurs and investors. This agreement follows the success we've had securing an exclusive six-year agreement for Brisbane to host the World Science Festival. And the agreement will again put an international spotlight on Queensland as a destination for innovation and investment. So please enjoy today. Have a great day. Uh, for those of you who have travelled um, from uh, different parts of Australia, you're always welcome to move here. <laughs> and for those of you who have travelled um, from overseas, where else but Queensland? <laughs> and uh, please bring your families and we hope to see you many, many times into the future. So please enjoy. Thank you very much for attending today and enjoy the Startup Festival in the new startup state of Australia. Thank you. Tech tourism. Tech tourism. 120,000 people visit Austin, Texas every March to attend South by Southwest. What that does is it brings major tech companies to locate in those vicinities. It creates opportunities for both businesses and individuals. It's a huge opportunity for Queensland. It's such an important announcement. It also combines really nicely with the announcement that the uh, Premier and the Minister made yesterday around Hot Desk Q. Up to $100,000 to attract uh, startups from other states and other countries to locate here in Queensland. Not just Brisbane either. Right? There are 13 regional centres where startups can locate. What an awesome initiative for our state. Why is it so important? It's not just about startups. It's not just about startups. This festival is not just about startups. This festival is about every single business in Queensland. This festival is about every single person in Queensland. Because startups help ordinary organisations innovate. They help every organisation to become more competitive, more relevant and more sustainable. So if your business is competing globally, then a startup can help you to innovate, help you to employ more Queenslanders, help you to sell what you do to the world. And so this festival is more than just about startups, it's about every person. Because for the people out there that have got kids, like me, I care about where my kids work in the future. I care about the opportunities that we have and the lifestyle that we have. Who agrees we've got an awesome lifestyle in Queensland? It's wicked, right? It is one of the best places in the world to live and it is one of the best places in the world to do business. And so this festival, what's happened over the last two days and the announcement the Premier just made about attracting uh, a really major event organiser to run significant startup focused events here in Queensland for the next three years will really, really help us to accelerate the development and the opportunities that comes from innovation in startups. So, I want to shout out to all the startups in the room. All the startups, stand up. Quick, 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 quick. We have so many wonderful startups. Give them a clap. Right. Four years ago, when I started Red Eye, four years ago, when Steve started River City Labs, there were very few startups and there was no ecosystem. Most of us were looking around going, how do we do this? Where do we go for help? Who's been there and done it before? 
And over the last four years, what we've been able to do is get a whole bunch of like-minded people together. And those people have gone, how can we share our experiences? How can we help the people that are starting new businesses to learn from the lessons we've, you know, we've had to pay for? And so the startup ecosystem, like the minister said, is really about giving before you get. It's really about helping companies and people to innovate and to succeed. And so I'm so grateful that you're here today. What I'd love to do is uh, kick off the first session um, by introducing two wonderful speakers to the stage. Um, I'd like to introduce Bindi and Steve coming up. And while they're coming up, give them a clap. We're going to play a quick video from uh, Cisco and we're going to flick into uh, uh, a video conference with an absolute superstar in the global startup space. We are at the tipping point and the signs are all around us. Businesses are measuring their lifespans in weeks and months. One room startups relentlessly burying their competition. 137,000 new companies launching every day. Though the majority of leaders know this new wave of the internet will impact their business, few know what to do about it. The choice is simple. Disrupt or be disrupted. 40% of today's top companies won't exist in five years. But that means that hundreds of new businesses will take their place. We're living in amazing, astonishing times. And only one company has the breadth of vision to guide businesses through the next wave of the internet. Every day, the world's most innovative companies rely on our people, our technology, and our experience to turn ideas into action. Action that could improve millions of lives. The next wave of the internet is here. We're ready. Are you? Give it up for Cisco and all of the sponsors that have helped us to put these couple of days together because without them, we couldn't do it. One of the most important things in thinking about how do we accelerate the opportunities for every person in Queensland was to look for startup ecosystems around the world that had learnt lessons and grown and matured. And so the first panel session this morning, it gives me enormous pleasure to uh, finally be able to attract an absolutely talented person uh, from the US to share his experiences around what's happening in the startup community in uh, the US and what lessons have they learned and what can we learn from them. So hopefully, in just a second, I'd love to introduce you to Brad Feld. G'day, Brad. Guys, Brad Feld is, um, is world-renowned for, uh, for the contribution and thinking that he has inspired in startup ecosystems right across America. Um, Brad, we are absolutely grateful to have you here. Thanks for giving up your time. How's the weather in Boulder? Uh, today is uh, crappy. <laughs> but you're still wearing it's, a great uh, shirt. It's, and a nice it's, stuck, it's stuck somewhere between snow and rain today. <laughs> Love it. Hey, Brad, what I wanted to do was I wanted to show you the audience so you got a sense of all the people in the room here that are committed to helping us build an awesome startup ecosystem right here in Queensland. So everyone stand up and look at the cameras. Quick, quick, quick. Brad, can you see them all? Awesome. Everyone wave. Yep. Great. Brad, we have a couple hundred people here and we've been on a journey over the last four years to really uh, build momentum in the startup ecosystem. And so uh, we're incredibly grateful to have you here. Up on stage with me, I have uh, the wonderful Bindi from the UK and the wonderful Steve from right here in, uh, in Brisbane. And they're going to talk after Brad. Um, Brad, we would love you to give us a little bit of a, who you are and a little bit about your experience building the ecosystem uh, in, the, uh, in the US and specifically Boulder. Sure. Well, thanks, uh, thanks for having me and thanks for letting me participate uh, remotely. Uh, it's uh, a lot easier than a long flight and hopefully it's valuable to you. Um, just by way of background, uh, I uh, was originally an entrepreneur. I lived in Boston, went to school in Boston, and started a company in the late 1980s. 
Uh, I sold it to a public company in 1993 and was their uh, chief technology officer. And while there, started making angel investments in uh, early stage tech companies all around the U.S. So I was based in Boston, but I was investing in Seattle and the Bay Area and L.A. and New York. Uh, my wife and I moved to Boulder, Colorado in 1995. Uh, it was random. Uh, I told Amy, my wife, that by the time I sold my first company, uh, we'd be out of, or by the time I turned 30, we'd be out of Boulder after, just after I sold my first company. And uh, a couple months before I turned 30, Amy told me she was moving to Boulder and I was welcome to come with her if I wanted to. Uh, we'd, been, we'd been married about five years, so it was a, a pretty easy decision. We knew one person and he moved away about six months later. So we really moved to Boulder to build our life rather than because we were going someplace for work or for family or for anything else. Um, I continued to make angel investments with my own money and did about 40 of those uh, in a, a three-year period. I then co-founded a venture capital firm uh, that was a Bay Area-based firm, uh, although I lived in Boulder at the time and stayed in Boulder, that raised uh, a couple billion dollars uh, between 1997 and 2000, had several successful funds, uh, and then ultimately on the back end of the internet bubble, uh, had a lot of, a lot of struggle. Um, we navigated through that, and in 2007, I started a new firm called Foundry Group uh, with three of my partners who had worked with me at, at uh, Mobius, and that's my primary activity today, investing in early stage tech companies uh, at Foundry, we've now raised uh, about $1.75 billion across six funds uh, since 2007, made about 100 investments uh, in early stage tech companies. Uh, we've also invested in many um, other venture capital firms uh, across uh, primarily the U.S. Uh, also in 2006, I co-founded Techstars, which is headquartered in Boulder. Their headquarters is literally across the hall from my office um, and that organization, which started in 2006 as the first mentor-driven accelerator program, it was one of the very first accelerator programs and the template for a particular style of accelerator uh, program, has now grown, has 20 programs uh, a year worldwide. We have a couple hundred companies going through Techstars. I think 700 have been through one of the Techstars accelerators. It's raised uh, over $2 billion from the various company, through all the various companies. So that's that's my background. In 2010, um, I started noticing a phenomena uh, in Boulder uh, that was worth reflecting on. So if you sort of travel back in time and travel back in time around the world, um, not just in the U.S., but, you know, especially in the, in, in the U.S. as a, a concentrated place around entrepreneurship, uh, in 2003, 2004, post-internet bubble, the idea of early stage entrepreneurship and startup activity was really um, flat on its back. Uh, there was a lot of uh, lack of interest in it, lack of funding for it. Um, there were certainly companies being created, and some of our really generational companies today, uh, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, were sort of started in the 2004 to 2007 time period. But at that time, it was a very, very sort of difficult and uninteresting uh, thing in the macro global economy. When we started Techstars in 2006, we were starting to see meaningful activity in Boulder around startup activity and seeing it elsewhere in the country. But even in 2007, when we raised our first Foundry Group fund, the idea of early stage tech uh, investing was very much out of favor with pretty much everybody, institutional investors and, and lots of other people that were thinking about business. Shortly after we raised our fund, of course, we had this thing that we like to refer to as the global economic crisis, which happened in 2008, 2009. But by 2010, um, I was noticing something around the notion of startup community, which wasn't a phrase that anybody used. And what was happening was there were a bunch of things in Boulder that suddenly were generating significant numbers of new startups and new companies. By about 2010, 2011, people were starting to talk about startups again. And you'd often hear about cities where the cities being described were um, the Bay Area or Silicon Valley, uh, Boston, New York, and Boulder. And it's important to recognize that one of those is not like the other three. The entire city of <laughs> Boulder fits in a single building 
in Manhattan. <laughs> our, almost our entire city fits in the Transamerica Tower in San Francisco. We're only 100,000 people, so we're a very small city, but we have this incredible density of startup activity in this very small city. Um, and it was growing in an accelerating, uh, accelerating pace. So I started working on this idea, uh, which resulted in a book I wrote in 2012 called Startup Communities. And that was really the first time that that phrase was used to describe the phenomena that had been going on in many places for a long, long time. Right? The activity of Silicon Valley is something um, that if you wind the clock back 100 years, and in fact, on my coffee table, I have a book that's titled 100 Years of Silicon Valley, and that book was written in 1994. So the idea of this very, very long generative process of company creation and startup community creation uh, was something that was rolling around in my head. Uh, I wrote this book. Um, it was uh, a derivative of my activity and my experience, not just in Boulder, but in investing all around the U.S. So even though I was based in Boulder, um, we invest as a firm nationally, and Techstars has programs in, in many different cities in the U.S. and now internationally. So I've had a lot of experience not just investing in uh, this one place, but in lots of different places. And the phenomena that I saw in the vibrant startup communities uh, were very similar. So I came up with uh, something I call the Boulder Thesis, and it's four principles that I believe that you, if you apply – to any city in the world that's at least 50,000 people, you can build a long-term sustainable startup community that really is essential uh, at the essence of every city. If you think about every city and go back in time to the beginning of any city that you're in, there's always an origin story. And that origin story is a set of people who decided to create the city. And there's lots of different reasons people created cities in different places, but every city is in its own sense a startup and has unique characteristics, just like every startup company has unique characteristics. And subsequently, every startup community has unique characteristics. The four principles of the Boulder Thesis in 2016 seemed fairly obvious, which was my goal when I wrote the book. Any, any good framework is one that in hindsight looks completely obvious. <laughs> Uh, but in 2012, when I wrote the book, uh, the notion was something that was not obvious. Uh, and it's very rewarding to see how it's impacted so many different communities around the world and how it's evolved from what that original uh, framework was. Uh, there's four elements to it, and I'll walk you through those four elements quickly. And then I want to end on a specific thing that I heard in the beginning, and I've heard several times since, and in fact, Wayne uh, used a phrase that uh, is, I think, underscoring or underlying uh, the whole idea of startup communities, uh, which is the notion of give first, and I'll, I'll end with that. So the four principles uh, in the Boulder Thesis, if you want to build a sustainable startup community, is first, um, the startup community, the leaders in the startup community have to be entrepreneurs. Everyone else in the startup community is what I categorize as a feeder. Um, now, leaders and feeders are both critically important to the startup community. One's not more important than the other. But if entrepreneurs do not play the leadership role, your startup community won't sustain over time. The feeders are organizations like university, government, large companies, uh, nonprofits supporting entrepreneurship, service providers supporting entrepreneurship, investors like venture capitalists and angel investors. Again, the feeders are critically important, but there has to be a critical mass of entrepreneurs playing, playing a leadership role. Now, interestingly, th this is, was, was the principle when I wrote the book. As I've evolved that and learned from that, one of the big lessons is that individual members of feeder organizations – can play leadership roles, and it's critical that they do. But the feeder organizations themselves can't be the ones that are trying to control and organize a startup community. And the reason for that is that a startup community, like many young companies, evolves as a network. Yep. Most feeder organizations, government, university, big business, are organized as hierarchies. And hierarchies are very effective 
a hierarchy is not the way that a small organic company evolves, and it's not the way a startup community evolves. The essence of this is that in this notion of a network, your power is not where you are in the hierarchy. It's the number of people you impact and the number of people that you interact with. It's not just the number of links that you have, you know, uh, friends on Facebook or followers on Twitter uh, or connections on LinkedIn, but it's the amount of activity bidirectionally across those connections. So you, you gain more power in a network as your node on that network grows through the number of connections you have times the activity across those connections. And activity, of course, value of the activity, substantive activity. So the entrepreneurs have to be leaders. Not all of them, just a critical mass. When I go back in time to when I moved to Boulder in 1995 and wind forward 21 years later, there's probably a dozen people that in 1995 were entrepreneurs who were playing a leadership role in the Boulder startup community then, who today in... Uh, 2016 are still playing a leadership role. Today, there's probably two, three, four hundred people who are playing leadership roles in the Boulder startup community. Again, out of a relatively small city, 100,000 people. Second principle is that you have to take a long-term view. And that long-term view has to be at least 20 years. When you think about building a startup, you don't build a startup in a year or two years or three years or five years. And yeah, every now and then something happens where a company that's a couple of years old gets bought for a billion dollars, or you have something that looks like an overnight success appear out of nowhere. Usually if you track it back to the beginning of time, it's taken them five to ten years to become even noticed as something that's now an overnight success. But many companies take 10, 15, 20, more, 20 or more years to build. The same is true of a startup community. So you have to have this long, forward-looking view of what you're doing and this commitment to your startup community that transcends short-term time frames. It transcends the annual cycle that you tend to see in academia, uh, which I like to describe as uh, uh, 12 months, which is really nine months of work with three months of summer vacation. Or it transcends the dynamics of government, where you have you know, an election, I don't know what the election cycle that you have uh, in, in your state and in your country is. I just, I just don't know it well enough. But in the U.S., we have uh, a circus every four years that we describe as our presidential election. And every two years, we have an intermediate election. So government kind of has less than two years to get anything done. And in a lot of cases, it's even less than that because there's election and things change. Big companies work in quarterly cycles. Startup communities have to work with a long-term view, a 20-year view that transcends the macroeconomic cycles, transcends all the different things that happen along the way. And most importantly, it's a 20-year view from today. So I've now lived in Boulder for 21 years. I'm not 21 years into my 20-year journey. I'm 21 years into a 41-year journey. And my journey will end eventually, whether I decide that I'm no longer on the journey or I vanish from this planet. But you have to have this viewpoint that's forward-looking for a long time. The third principle is that you have to be inclusive of anyone who wants to engage at any level in the startup community. What doesn't matter what they want to do, doesn't matter where they come from, doesn't matter their ethnicity, doesn't matter their nationality, doesn't matter their, their educational background, doesn't matter their previous experience. The startup community has to have a no, an attitude and an ethos of being inclusive of anyone who wants to engage. There's a lot of talk about diversity in tech right now. Gender diversity in tech is a very significant issue uh, in the U.S. Race, racial diversity in tech is also a very significant issue in the U.S., this notion of inclusiveness has to surround all of these things. Anyone who wants to engage should have the ability to be welcomed to engage in the startup community. Now, that doesn't mean that you won't have bad actors. That doesn't mean that you'll have people who want to engage that have a very clear agenda of what their goal is, and their goal is not in line with forwarding the startup community. 
if you have a robust developing startup community with a view of being inclusive, and you can build that into the culture, it's self-correcting. If people are constantly taking, people will stop engaging with them. If they're not giving before they get or asking, how can I help? And I'll get to this in a sec with Give First. Over time, the startup community will start to ignore them. Or they'll realize that if they want to build more power and have more influence and have more engagement in the startup community, that they have to actually contribute to it in a productive way. So you don't have to manage it. You don't have to have people that have to you know, get different roles. In Boulder, we don't have the president of the startup community or the vice president of membership. There's no membership fee. It's incredibly inclusive. And that allows you to build this very positive forward dynamic over time. The last principle is that you have to have activities and events that engage everyone across the entrepreneurial stack in startup activities, in entrepreneurial activities. So conferences and events are extremely useful because they're convening opportunities to get people engaged together talking about the startup community. But you have to go a lot further than that. You have to actually do things to create companies together. You have to come around uh, activities like accelerators. Uh, when we started Techstars, what Techstars was in Boulder in 2007, we ran the first program, was a 90-day program with 30 founders of 10 companies, a handful from Boulder, but most from not from Colorado, that had come to Boulder. And we surrounded them with 50 experienced founders uh, from other companies in Boulder, some that were you know, successes, some that were failures, some that had exited, some that were running their companies, some who were CEOs, some who were vice presidents of engineering or CTOs. And for 90 days, the essence of the startup community in Boulder was oriented around these 10 companies and helping these 10 companies over this three-month period go from where they were uh, and accelerate their process. And we didn't have any idea what we were doing in 2007. We we're just making up as we went. But on reflection, that activity of doing entrepreneurship rather than talking about it or speculating about it or studying it was the magic. Another example uh, is an organization that uh, is now owned by Techstars. Techstars bought it uh, last year, an organization called Up Global uh, that runs Startup Weekend and Startup Week. And the idea of a startup weekend is another one of these examples where you're actively participating in creating entrepreneurship. Um, if you don't know what startup weekend is, it's essentially a 54-hour simulation of entrepreneurship. You get together for a weekend, a bunch of people, 70, 80, 100 people get together, you start a handful of companies in a very short period of time, you go through all of the crazy things that happen at the beginning of the creation of a company. Sometimes companies come out of a startup weekend and actually turn into real businesses. Most of the time, you get engaged with other people who are interested in entrepreneurship and practice the art of entrepreneurship. You engage and do. So those are the four principles. Uh, entrepreneurs have to be leaders. You have to take a long-term view, at least 20 years. You have to be inclusive of anyone who wants to engage in any way. And you have to have activities and events continuously that engage the startup community in entrepreneurship. Now, I want to end on this uh, thing, which I heard a couple of times already, which made me smile, made me very happy when I heard it, which was uh, at the beginning, and I'm sorry, I don't, uh, I'm not going to remember names and write them down. I should have. Uh, the, the, the first person, uh, your, um, uh, not your minister, but the person who's running the, this initiative, um, talked about this notion of uh, asking how can you help. And the ethos in the startup community is asking how you can help. Carry that around with you all the time. This idea that as a participant in the startup community, it's not a zero-sum game. It's not I win, you lose. It's how can I help because that makes us all more successful in this part of our economy where if we can all grow it, it's very compelling. Link to that is what I heard uh, a few minutes ago, this notion of uh, give before you get. And in the book Startup Communities, there's a section on give before you get, 
where I talked about that as something that underlies the engagement model of a startup community. You should be willing to give into the system energy, work, time, resources without knowing what you're going to get back first. I've extended that, and the next book that I, I come out with, which will come out early next year, is a book called Give First, which is the official mantra of Techstars now. If you go on Twitter and type hashtag Give First, you'll occasionally see flurries of stuff around it. And essentially what Give First means is that you're willing to enter into a relationship without defining in advance what the transaction is, what you're going to get back from it. It's not altruism. You expect to get something back, but you don't know when, from whom, over what time period, in what consideration, and what magnitude it's going to be. So as the startup community, if you can get oriented around this notion of putting energy into the startup community without having to define transactionally what you're going to get back, my assertion is that you'll get back 10 times, 100 times more over a long period of time than if you defined it transactionally. And that's the essence of the mantra give first and the idea of give before you get. So with that, I'll end uh, on the front end. I hope that was helpful and I hope it worked uh, uh, from however many thousands of miles away we are. And I'm going to be with you, hear some from the other panelists, and then I think we're going to do some Q&A or maybe the other way around. I don't know. Awesome. Give it up for Brad. <laughs> Brad, um... You've had an enormous amount of influence on the startup ecosystem here in Queensland. Your book, the Startup Community book, has been read by so many members of our ecosystem. I know uh, there's a bunch of great people here in the startup working group that have been you know, interacting with you, sending you emails, trying to entice you to come out and to contribute today. Is, uh, so we're, we're really, really grateful. Um, we also have been doing startup weekends all around uh, our great state of Queensland. And uh, there are startup weekends happening in health, there are happening in different industries now, and uh, Toowoomba and uh, Cairns and Townsville. So it's, uh, you know, we are really trying to practice the, the, uh, the concepts that you have in the Boulder thesis. So uh, thanks for taking the time. I'd definitely love to um, get some of the other guys to have a bit of a talk, and then we're going to take questions from the audience. So use your hashtags, uh, AQ Summit and uh, Startup State. And we'll uh, pick up your uh, we'll pick up your questions, and we'll uh, ask them of Brad, Bindi, or Steve. So with that, I would love to hand over to Bindi. So Bindi uh, Korea has been in the startup ecosystem in the UK since it began. So in 2000, Bindi started interacting in the ecosystem back there. She has uh, she worked in a number of awesome capacities and has helped the development of over four thousand startups, right? So I think we could learn a thing or two from Bindi. Not only that, she also has worked with Silicon Valley Bank, one of the major uh, finance institutions that help startups. So with that, welcome Bindi. I'm going to look at that. I'm actually going to borrow these notes. Um, Brad, thank you very much for that. You've actually um, put into words and a structure exactly what I've been seeing happen in London. So I'm actually going to borrow your four points. I've completely thrown what I was going to say out the door. And I'm actually going to refer to these four points um, from a London context. So I was around in London in 2000. And I don't think it began then. There's always been technology. There's always been entrepreneurship. But around the time where technology and VC became very popular. And I worked at PwC Consulting. And actually, we set up an incubator back then, which was actually now seen as quite edgy. And of course, um, <clears throat> the dot-com bomb happened, and the incubator was promptly disbanded as IBM purchased that part of the business. And I lived through a nuclear winter, I, I like to refer to it, between 2002 and 2004, actually in a high-growth fintech startup. So sort of really, really having seen that. I think <clears throat> London started to reemerge in approximately 2008. And I, I love this concept of the leaders are the entrepreneurs. And between 2008 and 2010, there were a lot of people that were doing grassroots and community work. Um, I, I'm looking at you, Aaron, for example, and you know the kind of startup weekends that you know, you've been doing here uh, in this part of the world. That kind of stuff was happening in London. And <clears throat> there's a company called Huddle, and I call them out because they were like, we're lonely. 
we're only two co-founders of an organization um, focusing on, you know, they're an organization similar to Box. And they're like, we're lonely, we don't know what to do. So they started to create this um, event called Drink Tank. And it is exactly what it says on the box. And what was cool about Drink Tank was the entrepreneurs, all the founders would come to that. So you'd have probably 50, 80 CEOs just coming together, talking about um, you know, what it's like to be an entrepreneur. Um, and they're like, let's create this community and this ecosystem. At the same time, I was uh, working at Microsoft um, and we were launching this program called BizSpark. And BizSpark has now eventually morphed into what was now known as Microsoft Ventures. So at the time, the entrepreneurs are reaching out and saying to corporates like Microsoft at the time, um, can you pay for our drinks? So it was very straightforward. You know, those kind of corporates were the feeders of helping these entrepreneurs get together. And I think that was really great. So between 2008 and 10, you're having a lot of these startup weekend type of things. You're having a lot of these communities of entrepreneurs getting together, and they're starting to create the buzz. And some of Britain's largest companies were actually founded in that period of time. So that's sort of phase one and the entrepreneurs creating it. Phase two of what was happening in London, and I'll say that's probably late 2010 to 2000, um, early 2013. And what was happening there is a lot of incubators and accelerators started to pop up. Um, the precursor to what became Techstars in London actually was there. Um, we had Seed Camp, which was a seed fund focusing. We started to have the government get involved. And I think that was very key and very interesting to see how the government's getting involved here. So in late 2010, early 2011, this initiative called Tech City was um, created. And it was created on the back of entrepreneurs um, inhabiting an area of London called Silicon Roundabout. It was East London, super cheap property. Startups were spending time, you know, um, co-working and co-sharing on their own. And the government saw there's this whole mass of people in a part of London. Let's adopt that part of London. And that's where they created this organization called Tech City. Uh, more and more corporates started to get involved. Um, we had people like Google launching Google for Entrepreneurs. We had Microsoft continuing to do the work there. Um, we had Silicon Valley Bank getting their business banking license in London. And, and you're getting more and more people, the feeders, um, the advisors, the community leaders getting involved. And it was a really magical time. And at that point in time, companies like TransferWise were born. They were going through the seed camp incubator, um, et cetera. Then we go from early 2013 to um, 14. And what we're seeing there is we're getting more and more people involved in the ecosystem, more and more big companies getting involved. And the movement is shifting from early stage and incubators and early stage companies. And the movement is shifting from that to how can we scale up our companies? So we've got great companies, great technologies, great talent, but now we've got to help these companies grow and become the next big thing. And so that was a very interesting phase. And when then we forward to where London is today, and it is absolutely incredible. Um, talking about the events that Brad was talking about, there's now an event um, very much uh, driven by the mayor of London's team, uh, London and Partners, and that's called London Technology Week. 15,000 events in London, completely hosted by the community, self-driven, over the course of one week. It is utterly insane. The last two years, I think I'm going to four or five events a day, and you know, I do, we, you do end up collapsing at the end of the week, but you're just seeing absolutely everyone getting involved. The other comment about London is there are centers of excellence now coming to light. So we have all the early stage and, and the entrepreneurs building it, but now what we're seeing are centers of excellence. So in London, we have FinTech, obviously London being one of the banking capitals of the world. Um, I was actually comparing at an event three weeks ago, and there are 1,500 people there, mainly large banks and FinTech companies. And, and that event, even a year ago, was 400 people. So you can see it's almost tripled in size because FinTech is such a center of excellence. Other centers of excellence, um, given what London is good at, uh, I would say fashion tech's an interesting one. 
Um, retail technology is a very interesting one. Um, also, um, advertising, or mad tech as they call it, so marketing and advertising technology. So you're seeing a lot of these centers of excellence. And then the, I guess the final comment is talking about paying it forward. And from 2008 to 16, so you know, eight years into a journey that is 20 more years to go, as Brad says, um, people always pay it forward. So the folks that are like me, who come from big organizations trying to help the startups, it's about paying it forward. It's about making the connections. It's about opening the doors. And there is a generosity and a spirit in London that I'm definitely seeing that's the case. Looking at what's happening here in Brisbane, um, the announcement yesterday to me feels like what London was in approximately 2010. So it feels like that's where you guys are, where you've got the government supporting, you're starting to get corporates involved. This is the beginning of the big event. Um, you know, learning about Myriad and how they're launching the big event next year. Uh, it, it, it's at the very beginning of something. So it, it's quite interesting to see the parallels between what's been happening in London and the centers of excellence and what I see can happen here. So thank you very much. You were clap. <laughs> So we have, um, we do have a groundswell happening here in the ecosystem. There are a number of corporates uh, that have been contributing to, uh, to the startup ecosystem over the last couple of years. And I can't, I can't share everyone's name because there are literally heaps of them, but I will call out a couple. So I can see Cole sitting in there from Picture Partners. Well done, Cole. I can see Lisa's over there from KPMG. Um, I'm sure winners around somewhere from EY. Uh, there are a whole bunch, and there are only just a couple that I can see, right? There are a whole bunch of great corporates, BOQs over there, that are really trying to help. Morgan's is around. I see Clark Can in the background up there. There's a bunch of companies that are giving their time and energy to help startups get traction, get advice, find mentors, get access to problems to solve. Um, so it's a quite exciting time. So... I'd like to move on to our next speaker. Now, this guy needs no introduction, our local shark, but what he does, knew, does need is some recognition, right? Four years ago, Steve put his money where his mouth was. When there was really no ecosystem here in Queensland, Steve put money out of his own pocket and started to support the building of an ecosystem. He invested in a co-working space that didn't make money, that helped to build opportunity. Right? And you heard it before from both Brad and Bindi and the Premier this morning and the Minister. Right? Giving before you get is a fundamental aspect of our ecosystem. And so with that, give it up for my good friend, Steve Baxter. Oh, look, uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks, thanks Wayne. Um, I'm going to throw my talk away as well because look, Brad's points were absolutely fantastic. So I'm just going to go a little off the cuff here. Those who know me also know I speak really fast, so if I speak too fast, stick your hand up and I'll slow down. Um, I did start this four years ago, so uh, I, before that I was an entrepreneur in the telecoms and internet space. Um, looked around in Brisbane, uh, I found myself travelling to Sydney too much, and to be honest, whilst it's got a nice harbour, I don't really like the town very much. I wanted to do, I wanted to do more investments in Brisbane. So I, uh, I came back and wanted to actually help out and, and find the infrastructure that I thought was here, and it turned out it wasn't, so I, I started on the journey that's uh, River Sea Labs, which is a very successful not-for-profit, and it's exceptionally successful as a not-for-profit. I continue to contribute all the time, so I'll take all the, <laughs> all the corporate sponsorship I can get. Uh, we're obviously moving to the TC uh, Byrne building yesterday. Great announcement with the Premier and uh, Minister Enoch, um, which is fantastic. That's 5,000 metres of, of awesomeness that's happening there. Um, I love Brad's point regarding entrepreneurs as leaders. Um, and we... I think one of the failings that I've seen, and, and, and just take this as general comments, and I'm happy to get shouted down, is that we, we don't have enough entrepreneurs recycling back in yet. Um, we have people who have had some level of success coming back into the community, but we, you know, we need our Zuckerberg scale success coming back and giving into the community, we really do. I, I was a guy who once had a telco infrastructure firm, if you know what I mean. I'm, I'm, I'm not even the type of success that I'm trying to actually generate. So we need, we need more people being successful and, and paying it forward and paying it back into the community. I'm going to jump on my hobby horse here a little bit because I, I love his point about um, feeders are important but don't lead. We've got to get the order right here. This is not about innovation. I actually hate the term innovation. It's about entrepreneurship. 
We need people starting businesses. Right? As, soon as, you say as soon as you say innovation, it assumes it's going to be research or, or lab coat led. Now, entrepreneurs will use the output of the research sector, right? but innovators don't create businesses, entrepreneurs create businesses. We need to get the order right here. So, um, as Brad said, the, the feeders, in this case the university and research sector, play an awesome role in the community. Obviously, we've got Data61 moving into the precinct, which is, which is excellent, so we need them there, but they can't lead this debate. Entrepreneurs have to lead this debate, that's very important. Long term, 20 years, I'm like, well, I, the Premier was up here before talking about the next budget that's coming, I think she's got to talk about the next 20 budgets that are coming now. But um, I agree, it, it's, uh, I, it, uh, I had a really funny moment, and I, I noticed that Morgan's are here, a really funny moment when we saw my last company at the Scheme of Arrangement meeting where there was a brand new broker walked into the room and said we were such a great overnight success. That was nine years later, it was a hell of a night. So all of a sudden, everyone thinks that it's because it's gotten big, I suppose, more towards the end when these things tend to get big, that, that you're an overnight success. There's a lot of hard years in there, so 20 years is, a, is very valid. What do we have to do in 20 years? We need not 5,200 metres of co-working space, we need 50,000 metres of co-working space in that period of time. Um, and we need to be relevant. We need to, we need to not tie our ego to what we've built, because if, if that's no longer working, we throw it away. We're out here supporting startups. What startups do is they try all these really, really crazy ideas, and if it doesn't work, they either stop it or the market takes care of them and they'll get stopped. So, in our efforts to support this community, we're going to try lots of different things and not be proud. If it's not working, we stop it. The only stupid decision is to support something that's not working. So, um, we need to take uh, a lot of courage there. Understanding, and to the, call that to the politicians and their handlers that are in the room, that that's a lot of political courage, because you are talking about taxpayers' money or ratepayers' money. So, I understand that needs a lot of courage, and that needs to... So, when they do spend this, and they, they do go out with, like, ten programs, and the thing I like about the Advanced Queensland program, is they haven't picked on one area, they've probably given too much money to universities, but that's just my hobby horse. <laughs> but in general, they've, 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 they've gone with quite a, a, a wide front attack. So, I hope that in, in the years to come, they'll actually look at those various programs and go, well, did that work? If it didn't, stop it. If it does, support it more. So, uh, you know, let's, let's actually get the best leverage for the cash. So 20 years, I, I, I agree with there. And, and in 20 years' time, we need to see a lot more co-working spaces and, and whatever is relevant, who really cares? Uh, accelerators, hackathons, incubators, who, who, who really cares? Uh, inclusiveness and diversity, um, we're probably lucky in a lot of countries. We don't have the... the, the the, the stark racial issues I think that Brad spoke about here, but we do, definitely do have a gender diversity issue. So um, I think we need to solve that the right way in Brisbane. We need to actually make sure we have lots of good people starting out. We, we don't need to over-preference people at the, at, the, at, the end of the, at the end of the funnel. Let's actually overstuff the front of that pipeline with, with the, the, the correct balance, the appropriate balance of male, female, um, black, white, whatever, whatever the, the, the breakdown happens to be. But let's understand that we, we can't overly preference someone at the back end. We need to actually make sure they make it through the same trials as everybody else. And events and accelerators. I mean, River City Labs, we started it four years ago. Um, is Josh in the room here? Uh, no, he's not. So Josh is the, uh, the general manager at River City Labs. Well, I think we have done in four years around about 350 events, which is actually stupid. I, I think I'm burning through staff because of that but it's the one way we deliver content into this community. That's everything from a one-hour lunch and learn to three-day hackathons. We've had an accelerator program run out of there. We've had a mobile gaming fund run out of there. We are doing. You have to get out there and do. If it doesn't work, don't do it again. If it works, keep doing it. So we're trying lots of different things. We've had awesome support from the Pitchers, the Morgans, the McCulloughs, the, the KPMGs, everyone that, that Wayne's mentioned as well, um, which is really good. My, my goal out of this is I, I want to see billionaires in Brisbane, and I want to see them here. I want to see them with you know, buildings out there with names on them doing things we've never heard about before and you know, that us old people would just shake our head at, and who really cares, because traction trumps opinion. If it's working and they're creating jobs, who really gives? We're not that high brow. We're going to demand whatever our success comes from. We want our success and we want our jobs. So, um, so the pay it forward is important there. I encourage all professionals. I don't see this as much now, but there's still an undercurrent of this in, in all of Australia and in Brisbane as well, that, that people who hang around the startup space expecting it to be this, some, some massive font of fees that they can charge startups are dreaming. These I mean, homeless men have more money than startups. So, uh, sorry, I'm probably going to get done for that one on Twitter. But 
you have to pay it forward. And there are, and the examples Wayne mentioned before are just some great firms, amongst others, lots of others, who pay it forward. I still see the spivs. I still see the people in there, literally like a limpet mine on the edge of a startup, either sucking out the record or sucking out their money, and you will kill this company early. If you get it right, you'll make so much money at the back end, it'll, it'll, it'll shake your head. Make money at the back end, not the front end. That's, that's a really important thing when it comes to uh, supporting these companies. So my, my personal mission is to see more success, a bit uh, along what Wayne said, in that we need our kids to have a lot more options in life, which just aren't you know, driving a dump truck uh, at a mine site or fly and fly out. Um, that's, that's really important. Uh, Wayne wanted me to mention you know, that I think that the, uh, the stuff I've done with the TV show Shark Tank's important, because what I really want to see is that we actually put our entrepreneurs up on pedestals, not just our chefs. I was going to actually be quite cruel to chefs in that comment until I had the gala dinner on Wednesday night. It was fantastic. Um, but really, if we, can, if we can put our entrepreneurs up on that pedestal as much as we can actually put chefs and home makeover people and God knows who else actually gets fame, that's when we can start turning this around. So there's lots of things to do. We've got to actually start celebrating success. We've got to tolerate people trying. Okay, forget the word fail. And in some respects, uh, the word fail is dangerous because a lot of people, when they go into these startup businesses, it's almost like they're giving themselves permission to fail at the, at the front end. So you've got to be careful that you don't make too much of a big deal or a failure. Because I know that if someone's pitching to me and, and they're a pre-assuming failure in the business, I'm not going to invest in them. It's just a silly idea. I need them to try their hardest and to go so big into that business that they, uh, they give it the right red-hot crack. So um, you don't want to have a self-fulfilling prophecy by talking about that too much. But when that idea doesn't work and that entrepreneur stops doing it, you then need to tolerate the consequences, which is what we know as failure. So let's just put that in the right context as much as we can uh, in, in through the community. Um, so, so with that, I, uh, the, the last point I wanted to make was um, what the government is doing good in my little quick before about the budget and government at various levels doing things, federal, state and even, even local government. This support's not here forever. Yes, it is long term, right? But these politicians are being brave. They've got a wider community that they report to. So um, at some point that money's gonna run out and we have to do the best we can with it in the meantime. We have to leverage it. They're, they're there, they're actually repairing a market failure in our startup ecosystem in this state and country and city. So um, we need to acknowledge that. And just because we all agree it's 20 years, I don't think we should expect uh, uh, advanced Queensland style funding for 20 years, although it'd be nice if we could get that. That'd be excellent. <laughs> We're building a startup ecosystem, and it's all of us, right? Everyone's got a role to play, everyone's got an opportunity to contribute, and our whole economy will win as a result of it. We want to be an economy where we're creating products and services that are utilised all around the world, and that revenue is sustaining our lifestyle, and that's the objective of, of our startup ecosystem. So, uh, with that in mind, I would love some questions from the audience. Brad's graciously hung around. We've got the talents of Bindi and Steve both up here. So if you've got questions, let's go to the first one right here. Uh, let me have a look. How can we sustain the energy of events and engagement and the entrepreneurial spirit in Queensland? It's the first question uh, from Glenn. So um, Brad, how do you sustain the, uh, the energy and the enthusiasm in Boulder? <laughs> Uh, there's two things that I, I'd say here. One is um, the notion of sustaining it uh, is not a consistent idea. So it's not that you're trying to have as an individual the same uh, level of engagement every single day, and it's not as though the startup community is going to have a consistent uh, level of engagement. It's also easy to fall into the seductive trap of measuring, yeah. which is to say, oh, well, we had this much this year, and next year we have this much, and then the year after we have this much, and so, you know, we're making progress. You're going to have these cycles, and you have cycles at the individual level, you have cycles at the, the uh, uh, sort of tempo of individual events, you have cycles in terms of very specific intense periods of time, um, you know, the idea of a startup week, uh, you know, we have Boulder Startup Week, which we we're, I think, in our seventh year of it uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, if we had Boulder Startup Week every month, we'd be screwed. <laughs> like, we'd just all roll over and die. But for one week, it's really powerful. 
the idea of having an accelerator once a year is very powerful. We've actually tried to do in cities multiple Techstars programs in the same year, and the most we can do is two. And even that's difficult because you wear people out. Yeah. If you're a founder, the idea that you're going to spend 50% of your time on your startup community is nonsensical because you've got a company to run. Yeah. And there's going to be periods of time that you're running your company and you're going to have no time for the startup community. And so this idea that you start cycling in, cycling out, as long as the engagement is such where anyone who wants to engage can, and that if you cycle out and you cycle because you have other priorities and you cycle back in, that's okay too. In the same way as humans, you know, we need a break from things to refresh. You go on a vacation, refresh. Think of that cycle as critical to the way that you approach what you're doing with the startup community. Yeah, it's, it's a great idea, and certainly in our community, uh, you know, we've got a small number of people working really, really hard at the moment, and so by building the community, it will allow uh, those people to take some time off to recharge. Um, we've got another great question here, and it's a question around, you know, what lessons have you learnt? Um, and this question I'd love to ask to both Bindi and Brad. You know, you look back at the development of your ecosystems, and if you were trying to build a new ecosystem now or you were advising us on what could we do to accelerate the development of the ecosystems that we're building, not just here in Brisbane, but the ecosystems in Mackay and Townsville and Cairns and the Gold Coast and the Sunny Coast and all those other great places. What are some things that we could do to accelerate? Um, <clears throat> I would say, you know, do what you can to get more of the feeders involved. So obviously, you know, to your point, we've got to get the entrepreneurs driving it and you've got to get the entrepreneurs starting it. But there's so many people that want to be involved. And, and I think having more of that, I think the London story, it was genuinely just the entrepreneurs um, driving it at the beginning. But the external parties, such as the advisors or the corporates, were not really getting involved till, or, or government were not really getting involved until later. So I think pulling all the elements together at once and, and having that, I think that will make a difference. That makes sense. And I'm seeing that happen in other countries in Europe. It's much quicker development than you would have seen in London. Okay. So. Brad? Uh, I, would, I would say don't worry about it. Okay. Um, it's human nature to want things to happen faster, to make more progress, you know, to measure yourself against some other, you know, uh, metric you know, or some other standard than you. In the context of playing a long-term game, you know, 20 plus year game, don't worry about it. Um, the tempo and how fast things change is not going to be consistent. And you know, as an investor in, in many, many companies, the companies that try to go too fast too early are often the ones that blow up or they waste all their resources before they've figured out what they're actually trying to do and they run out of money. Or they burn out the really, really capable people because there wasn't enough of a base for the energy that they put into it. So in terms of trying to accelerate or speed up the growth and development of your startup community, it's a little bit of a, 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 a I don't want to say a, a, a false, false is the wrong word, it's a trap. Right? And the trap is that you, you, you have a natural tempo. The, the things that Bindi said are absolutely right, right. You want to get more people involved. You want to get concentrated focus. You want to be inclusive. But you don't do that to go faster. You do that to get more engagement. And if the engagement is substantive and working, then you will accelerate. So maybe it's cause and effect. Makes great sense. Hey, Brad, we've got a number of... Uh a number of people in the room from communities around Queensland. And Queensland's uh, a significantly large state, uh, twice as big as Texas. And so we've got, often we've got communities of less than 100,000 people that are really keen to look at how they can, uh, uh, how, how can they build startup communities? What, yeah, what, what advice have you got for smaller regional communities? Well, I have to say, I have to tell a joke before that. I grew up in Dallas, Texas, so, um, uh, <laughs> Uh, I understand the notion of being uh, half as big as something else because my wife's from Alaska and she tells me regularly that if you cut Alaska in half, Texas would be the third largest state in the United States. Um, 
So, so uh, thanks for reminding me of, of uh, where Texas sits in the uh, hierarchy. Um, uh, as a Coloradan, I get to say bad things about Texas all I want now. So the, 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 the very powerful thing, and I, I like the way you frame the question, the very powerful thing is this notion that you're not trying to build a startup community in isolation from other startup communities. Yeah, I love it. Um, if, if you think about even a city like, I'll use Boston. I lived in Boston for 12 years, and I know it very well. Boston, which is a couple million people, and a relatively small physical proximate area. Uh, if there's no traffic, you can get from one end to the other you know, in 10 minutes, and you can get anywhere you want in about 30 minutes out into the suburbs if there's no traffic. Now, traffic makes it a whole other issue. Just within Cambridge and Boston... Uh, in the core, there are six separate startup communities. Wow. And so when you talk about the Boston startup community, you're really talking about six different startup communities. You call them neighborhoods if you want, but they're all connected together. And when you think about the Massachusetts startup community, you're not just talking about Boston and Cambridge, which are actually totally separate cities, but there's a bunch of other startup communities. In Colorado... It's each individual city has a startup community, and then you've got lots of smaller cities that have developing startup communities. The neat thing about it is you don't have to come up with a brand, right? You don't have to call it Silicon Roundabout or I don't, uh, Silicon Flatirons or Silicon Mountain or Silicon Glen. You, you just call it your city, your Boulder, your uh, you know you know your Queensland, your wherever you are. You could be your country, you can be your state, you can be your city. That's the focal point. When you start taking the smaller cities throughout Queensland and you connect them together, and I don't, you know, Brisbane, let's say Brisbane's, is Brisbane the largest city in, yep. in Queensland? Yep. So Brisbane's the largest city. Here's the magic trick. If Brisbane is the center of the universe and you expect everybody else in all the other cities around Queensland to come to you, you're screwed. Yeah, I agree. What, what you want to do is you want to go to them. And what you want to do is you want to go to them so that you start, again, think of that network model. Your node is getting bigger because you're engaging with other startup communities. You're building a link to those other startup communities, and they are subsequently then going to come back and engage with you. If you're a small startup community, what you want to do is you want to be inclusive and welcoming of anyone from the other startup communities. And the best way to get somebody to come to you is to go to them first. Love it. The best way to get somebody to do something for you is to do something for them first. If you send me an email and you say, hey, Brad, thanks for doing this talk. Will you do something for me? My chance of doing something for you is a lot less then if you send me an email and say, hey, I just did this thing for you that impacts your world in a positive way. I appreciate you spending some time with me. And oh, by the way, can you give me some feedback on this? Of course I will. Same thing from city to city, and especially for the larger geographic areas, people in those cities to really make an effort uh, to engage proactively with others. Awesome feedback. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's 9.37, and we're, uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. Now, I know we, uh, many of us in the room would love to, uh, love to spend time talking about what we're doing and how we're building the ecosystem, and I encourage you to continue the conversation uh, out there with all the great startups and around coffee and tea. So I really appreciate you helping me to show these wonderful people how much we value their time, their experience, and their insights. So thanks very much, Brad, Bindi, and Steve. Thanks, everyone.